the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. And I know that that is often the way we end our worship, but it works perfectly well as an introductory blessing. And I've chosen to do it this way round because I'm actually doing a lot of my service sort of back to front today for good reasons, partly because it's nice to mix things up occasionally and do things a bit different, but it seems to me to fit better this way because I want to look at something, I hope, positive and optimistic and work up towards that. So we're going to work up towards our prayers of adoration and love and praise and the, the prayers of intercession, which we'll come to in a moment, where we remember the needs of the world and the, the problems of the world. It's not that I want to get that out of the way exactly. I think these things have to be acknowledged but I, I don't want to end up focusing on those things. So we'll do our praying for others first, then the address, then the prayers of adoration. And who knows, I may even end with a welcome. Um, we're back here, by the way, in um, Sleaford, the, the background. Uh, we've not visited all the different churches in our circuit yet, but I haven't been to a couple of them yet to get photographs. That will be remedied over the next few weeks. So if your church has been missed out, uh, don't panic. It will appear sooner or later. But we are on a return visit to Sleaford this week. So without further ado, we'll move to our prayers for the world. We, we come to worship often with heavy hearts, often with the, the weight of the world's concerns on our shoulders. And it's good that even at the beginning of a, a service, we lay those burdens before God and, and bring them all and place them in, in his hands. So let us pray. Lord God, we pray today for the needs of this world and especially for those things which are in the news at the moment and are most upon our hearts. We think of the, the devastating situation in Afghanistan. Lord, it's so terrible to see some of the images there of people living in fear, desperate to leave, and yet unable to do so. We pray, Lord, for wisdom in all parties, those who have taken over the ruling of that land, those who still have, at least for the next few days, some measure of influence within that land. Lord, bless those nations across the world who are willing to offer refuge to people fleeing from Afghanistan. We pray that as a world community, we will somehow be able to handle this in a way that sees the minimum of bloodshed, the minimum of fear. Lord, we, we see a desperate situation there, but we plead with you that it will somehow be resolved, that our, our worst fears may not be realised. Lord, bless that land, bless its people, bless all those who show concern and are working for peace. Strengthen their hand, Lord. Give them wisdom and courage in all they do. And we pray, Lord, for the ongoing pandemic and the many whose lives still are tainted by fear over the future, by worries of ill health or by bereavement through the death of a loved one or through an ongoing illness that has been caused by this pandemic, or not treated because of the pandemic. Lord, there is so much suffering that has happened of people being ill and needing and 
longing for healing and treatment and help. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon all those who are seeking to find cures, to bring healing, to bring hope back into the lives of people who are so worried. Bless our governments, bless the other governments around the world as they seek to, to guide us out of this time of pandemic into a better future. And Lord, we bring to you other prayers for people and situations which cause us anxiety. Friends who are ill, friends who are sad or lonely, wherever we see hardship and suffering, Lord, our heart goes out to those people. But we turn to you as the God who cares and the God who loves us and the God who challenges us to do something about these terrible situations. Give us the strength, we pray, to meet the needs of those who suffer. All our prayers we offer in the name of our Lord and our Saviour, Christ Jesus, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And let's join in the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. And we're going to sing, O oh, love of God, how strong and true this hymn is all about, the, the love of God for us and the different ways in which that love shows itself. And it's setting the, the scene for our theme today, which is about, very much about, God's love for you and for me.
Today we're going to look at a reading from the Old Testament, which is one of the suggested Old Testament readings in our lectionary. And it's from a, a book that I'm not sure I've ever really preached on before. The Song of Solomon, or sometimes called the Song of Songs. Traditionally, uh, Solomon wrote this, but nobody's really quite sure uh, of its origins. And I'm reading chapter 2 and verses 8 to 13. That's the actual suggested reading. There is much more of this that could be read, but we'll focus on those few verses. The voice of my beloved. Look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands beside our wall gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, the rain is over and gone. The flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. Thanks be to God for his word. Although you may wonder why we call this God's word, it's a very unusual book. I don't think there's anything else quite like it in the rest of the Bible. It's a book of love poetry, something like Shakespeare's sonnets, but from a diff very different time and a very different era. And the, the style is very different. The, the poetic elements and the, the images used, very different from the days of Shakespeare but it's the same basic idea. It is celebrating the love between two people, the lover and the beloved. And each one has a voice within this book. So what's it doing in the Bible? Well, in Old Testament times, this was often seen as a kind of metaphor, an extended parable, if you like, uh, showing the, the love of God for his people, Israel. In Christian thinking, we could see it as a metaphor for the love between Jesus and his people, the church. Sometimes Jesus himself used that metaphor of himself as the bridegroom, the church, his bride. The language of love is one that uh, is highly appropriate to describe our relationship with God through Jesus, our Lord, our Saviour. What I want to do with this passage is the opposite of what I've done many times in the past uh, at weddings. One of the, the favourite readings, in fact, I suppose the favourite reading for couples at a wedding is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And you know that chapter, I'm sure. It's got phrases in like, love is patient, love is kind, love keeps no record of wrong, love never ends. And it, it, the last uh, part of the chapter reminds us that these three remain, faith, hope and love, but the greatest of these, you've guessed it, it's love. And it, it's quite understandable why a couple getting married would choose that as a reading, because it's a chapter all about the nature of love. But it wasn't written for a wedding. It was written by Paul to a, a church in Corinth who had 
all kinds of uh, problems with factions and disputes and they weren't getting on well with each other and Paul is writing to them to encourage them to love each other. It's about the love within a church. It's, it's a spiritual kind of love, not a, a romantic, sexual, erotic kind of love. And yet it's chosen for weddings. And what I've got used to doing over the years is taking a, a passage which is about one kind of love and uh, a, a more spiritual kind of uh, description and applying it to romantic love and drawing lessons from it that will help a couple getting married. Well, today I want to do the opposite to that. I want to take uh, a passage which initially at least seems to be about romantic love. There's a, a sensuality about it. Uh, it. It's at times quite erotic, although uh, perhaps we miss it in, in this modern day and age. We don't necessarily pick up all the illusions, uh, but it, it's romantic love. And yet I want to, to take that and apply it to a more spiritual kind of love. The love that is between us and God. One of the things that comes out quite strongly, I think, in, in this whole uh, book, and even in the few verses I've read, is the sense of, of joy. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a playfulness about it. It's a very happy kind of book, but there's a deep joy there. And I want to look at three different kinds of joy. One is, is the joy of seeing the beloved and the thrill that that gives. Another is the joy of realizing that your beloved has eyes only for you, that you are loved. And then the third kind of joy is the joy of the invitation to come away, come with me. So those are the, the three things that I, I want to look at. And the, the first comes in the, the opening words really, look, Look, he comes, leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. <clears throat> I can't help but think of films and the way that some characters are introduced within films. I recently saw Romancing the Stone for a third or fourth time, I think. Um, and that begins with a... Um, a romantic writer uh, coming to the end of the st her story and it's portrayed in the film as if these events actually are happening. There's a, a Western scene, there's a, a glamorous female and she sees in the distance the, the hero uh, on horseback silhouetted uh, on the horizon. I, I've managed to get what I, I think this is the still picture from the film, I'm not 100% sure, but it was something like this anyway. And there's this, this sense of joy. There's my hero. There's my beloved. There's my uh, my lover. Get the terminology right here between lover and beloved. There's my lover, uh, who's uh, appeared. And, and it, doesn't he look great and majestic there on his his horse, ready to come and ride to my rescue and so on. And later in the the same film, uh, the the writer actually does meet a sort of rugged character and. He doesn't appear on a horse, but he appears silhouetted on the horizon. Here he is, Michael Douglas, if you weren't quite sure who that is, um, who becomes the hero of the film, uh, coming to the rescue of the, the damsel in distress. And th there is something of that joy of excitement at seeing the, uh, the lover appear. A couple of more recent examples of, of uh, people appearing, which were deliberately intended by the filmmakers to evoke a sense of excitement and passion. Uh, one is uh, Dr. No, Ursula Andrus, uh, uh, emerging from the sea. And there were a whole generation of men, I gather, who uh, went all weak at the knees at the sight of that bikini. Um, I have to admit, I don't number myself amongst those. I, I perhaps came to this film um, too late and I never quite saw what people got so worked up about, but hey, um, you know, 
everyone's different and the things that have uh, attracted me and got my heart beating a bit faster and made me go weak at the knees, uh, other women in other films. And wild horses would not drag out of me which women and which films. I've learned early on, um, I do not reveal this, especially to my children who would tease me mercilessly if, if ever I even let slip a, a, a hint of a, a glamorous female that I found attractive, it would be a case of dad loves whoever. Um, and, and also I, I've discovered it's not right for a, a man to reveal to his wife that he finds another woman attractive. This is a very bad idea. Although for some reason, it seems to be quite acceptable for women to reveal to their husbands that they find other men attractive. I don't know why. Um, so for the ladies out there or for those who find men attractive, how about Colin Firth? Uh, also a scene where he emerges from water. Uh, you know the one I mean, Pride and Prejudice, the BBC production. And here he is. Uh, I couldn't get a terribly good uh, photograph of this, I'm afraid, and the still photograph perhaps doesn't do it justice. But that moment when he, he approaches up the lake, again, apparently, seemed to make a lot of middle-aged women go all weak at the knees uh, and drool over Colin Firth. Well, you may have your own um, moments where you've been attracted to someone and the filmmakers go out of their way to, to make this happen. They have appropriate music, uh, you know, the, the lighting's all appropriate, the, you know, the, the person is presented in the most glamorous uh, and sexually attractive way that, that, that is possible. I'm getting a knocking at the door. I don't know if that's telling me I should be shutting up about sexual things. One moment. I thought for a moment that that knocking was my wife having heard me talk about people being sexually attractive and, and knocking on the, the study door to tell me to stop it. Um, she did just admit now that if my daughter was listening to this, she would be telling me it's wildly inappropriate. But I make no apology because this is what the Song of Solomon is about. It's about sexuality. It's about finding someone attractive. It's about that, that thrill of, of seeing your lover. And I, I've tried to paint a few pictures of uh, examples of that to, to try and encourage you to see that that's what's going on here. It may not come across quite so clearly because of the, the images. Um, my, my lover's like a gazelle, a young stag uh, bounding down the mountain that may or may not fill you with desire, I don't know, but it was intended to fill you with desire. This is a, an image of, of love, passion, sensuality. There's a, a certain eroticism here that's all bound up with this story of the beloved and the lover. Some, some of you may have had those moments, either watching films or in reality, when you actually see uh, someone that you love coming towards you, or you see them in a particular light and your heart goes out to them. Those moments of, of joy at, at the sight of your lover. Have you ever felt that with God? Have you ever seen God in that light? Not, not in a, an erotic way, but in a, in a way that brings that deep joy and excitement, a way that thrills you. Maybe uh, it happens from time to time because of music, because of um, particular words that are, are expressed, uh, particular poetic kind of language, whatever turns you on. Maybe it's silence and quiet and, and the beauty of nature around you that, that stirs these things. But there needs to be, or there ought to be, a joy when we see our images of God. The, the, the wonder of the creation all around us shows us God the Father's love for us and, and his power and his majesty. There's a different kind of love to be seen 
in the image of Jesus on the cross. God's power and love shown in weakness and humility and his willingness to suffer on our behalf and to die for us. That there are many different images that we may have which stir up that sense of joy, that thrill within us. And the, the passion that we see in this story of the Song of Solomon, that's um, a shadow of the kind of deep joy that we ought to have in our encounters with God. Look, there is my lover. But what's truly exciting, that an even greater joy than just seeing an image, a silhouette uh, in, in the distance, someone coming out of the sea, is when that person has eyes only for you. The problem with watching things on film is that the, the person that we see has no awareness even of us as the viewer. We're just there in the cinema or at home on the settee and, and they're a character on the film. There's no real relationship. Within the film, Ursula Andress has eyes only for Sean Connery. Mr. Darcy has eyes only for Elizabeth Bennet. And that's where relationships start to develop. But um, if I'd been on the beach alongside Sean Connery, as Ursula Andress emerged from the sea, I don't suppose she'd have given me a second glance. I, I would be a mere observer. But there is the thrill in this passage of the lover bounding down the mountain like a gazelle. Here he comes and look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks. He says to me, he, the beloved actually has come to talk to me, says, sorry, the lover has come to talk to me. I'm getting my terminology a little confused here, aren't I? Because they're both beloved of each other anyway. We'll not try and go back and correct all that. But here's the one who has caused a thrill in my heart and he's talking to me. It reminds me very much of those sort of teenage movies you have where uh, in, in a high school in America, there's the, the group of girls and they're all drooling over some hunk of a, of a boy uh, who's, who's absolutely gorgeous. Oh, God, don't I fancy him? That's the kind of language that uh, is not poetic, but it's, it picks up the, the, the sense of emotion. And, and there they are. Uh, oh, what a gorgeous hunk. And then he comes over and he speaks to one of them. And that one is, oh, he spoke to me. He's invited me to the prom or whatever. He's noticed me. He wants to talk to me. And, you know, that's even more exciting than just seeing him at a distance. This is our God, the God who has eyes only for me. I use the word only in that sentence a little bit loosely. Of course, um, our relationship with God and his with us is not an exclusive one. Within human relationships, there is a kind of exclusivity. Uh, in a, the marriage service, you make a promise that forsaking all others, you will be faithful to him or to her. Um, which is not to say that there aren't other kinds of love in your life. There's the love of family, um, parents, children, brothers and sisters. There's the love of, of friends, but, but the kind of special intimate relationship between two people who are married is something that is exclusive, that they should only have eyes for each other. And of course, it's not quite like that with God. God loves me, he loves you, he loves the person next door, he loves the person at the other side of the world, he loves all those people that we've prayed for at the start of this worship. He loves everyone. Uh, his love is not an exclusive one, but it can feel like that when you realise that amongst all those people, God actually does love me. He, it feels as if he only has eyes for me. It feels as if he's come down from the mountain and he stood at my window and he's looking in and then he's talking to me. It may not be literally true, but it's, it's how I feel about it. 
God's love is for you. God loves you personally. If you were the only girl in the world, and there's a song title for you, if you want to write a song on that. No, it's been done too late. If you were the only girl in the world, or the only boy in the world, or the only human being in the world, God would still love you. If there wasn't anybody else, Jesus would still have died for you. God loves you that much. Never forget it. And there should be some sense of excitement in discovering that. Not that God is, is gorgeous and lovable in an erotic way, no. But God is powerful. He's our lover and he loves me. That's a, another deeper kind of joy. But then the third kind of joy is the invitation. Come away with me, says the lover. Come on, let's go. God wants to spend his life with us. Not just part of our lives, but he wants to live with us and to spend time with us. He doesn't want to have a relationship that starts at half past 10 on a Sunday morning and finishes at half past 11 on a Sunday morning. He wants to give his life to us and us give his life to him. He wants to be with us, to enjoy our life together. And again, it's not an exclusive thing. We are with other people a lot of the time, but God is there by our side, our support and our strength. Jesus Christ is with us always. And I've been talking about God and Jesus a little interchangeably here, I suppose, because it may be a bit difficult to, to fall in love with a God who is remote and powerful and uh, almighty. It may be a bit easier to fall in love with Jesus. He's the, the human face of God. He's all that God is, all that God the Father is, all that God the Spirit is. He is God. And yet he's got that human face that we can perhaps relate to more easily as a friend, a saviour, a lover. In a, a literal sense, he loves us. We love him. What I want really to do today is simply to get across that sense of deep joy that comes across in the Song of Solomon. The beloved and the lover uh, have, have this wonderful, playful joy going on in their relationship. And that's how it can be, and that's how it should be at times between us and our Saviour Jesus. May you discover that same love in your life. We're going to sing again and then pray, but I've put an extra instrumental verse at the start and the finish of, of what we're going to sing. Father, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Spirit, we love you. Um, but an extra verse at the start and the end for you to bring your own thoughts, your own worship and praise, your own expressions of love to the one who loves us through and through.
Let us pray. Father God, we love you. We love who you are, a God of boundless creativity, a God of overwhelming grace, a God of majestic beauty. We cannot imagine a more compassionate, more just, more powerful God. Jesus, Lord, we love you. We love who you are, a lifelong companion, a saviour, willing to give your life for the sake of the world. A perfect example of what human life should be like and can be like. We cannot imagine a more faithful friend, a better help in time of trouble. Holy Spirit, we love you. We love who you are. A subtle but effective influence in our lives. An opener of ears and hearts. An unsettling presence urging us to become new people. We cannot imagine a more reliable advocate, a more gracious disturber of our complacency. Spirit, Son and Father, you are oneness expressed in relationship. And we love you. Amen. And it's not me who is going to give the final welcome, but God himself opens his arms to welcome you. Come, my beloved, come away with me. May you find joy in his welcome. Amen. <laughs>